next speaker <laughs> is Ed Thorne. Ed is a writer and improviser from London. His outstanding scientific credentials are compromised only by being entirely fictional. <laughs> we have got to stop letting them write their own descriptions. <laughs> and improvising their own descriptions. Uh, so, I know, I, 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 you've made that very clear, Zach. So far, his main contribution to science has been staying out of science, <laughs> for which scientists are very grateful. <laughs> Put your hands together for Ed Thorne. So, most of the matter in the universe is missing. When we go and look up through our telescopes, we only see about 11% of the matter we expect to see there. Uh, the rest is what we call dark matter. <laughs> but we're never really looking at space. Uh, it's really difficult to make big lenses, so modern optical telescopes tend to use big mirrors instead. So it's not really accurate to say that most of the universe uh, isn't visible. It's more accurate to say it's more accurate to say that most of the universe doesn't have a reflection in the mirror. Yeah, so, so the implication is, is somewhat obvious. Um, <laughs> dark matter is primarily composed of vampires. I, I know hindsight is a hell of a thing. Um, so meet the WIMP, or weakly interacting massive particle. Uh, we're proposing a specific kind of WIMP that we're calling a vampirically attractive massive particle, or VAMP. Uh, so, so VAMPs are... Uh, vampires are a great candidate for wimps as a kind of dark matter for a couple of reasons. So firstly, uh, wimps are typically expected to be uh, slow moving, also known as cold dark matter, which is consistent with the cold, cold blood of undeath. <laughs> uh, and, and secondly, and perhaps more convincingly, um, wimps are typically expected to be much larger than most particles, and vampires are much larger than most particles. <laughs> Okay, so, so why don't vampires have a reflection in the mirror anyway? Because it's, it's kind of weird, because photons don't really care if they're hitting an eye or hitting a mirror. It, it shouldn't make a difference. So the only way this really makes sense is if vampires just don't interact electromagnetically at all, which is actually consistent with our observations, because if you think about it, we don't see vampires out of the mirror either. <laughs> so... Um, the thing is, there must, be, there must be some kind of force that vampires can use to interact with the world, and we have a kind of hint as to what this might be. See, vampires are typically either highly attractive or deeply repulsive, um, sometimes having a sort of magnetic quality to them. Uh, and this, this, lends credence to, um, this lends credence to the already proposed hypothesis of dark electromagnetism, which, as it sounds, is literally just an analogue for electromagnetism that works with dark charge on dark matter. <laughs> Okay, so, so my research team uh, was really interested when we came across this, because then we thought, well, okay, if there's, um, there's going to be dark electromagnetism, maybe there's also, say, a dark Higgs. And, and what if the dark Higgs is, is much stronger than the light Higgs? Could, could that explain the, the mass discrepancy between dark matter and light matter? Uh, unfortunately, that turns out to be kind of a dead end, because the Higgs only provides about 1% of baryonic matter's mass. Um, so actually, the dark Higgs would have to be about 500 times stronger than the light Higgs to account for the discrepancy. Now, now 500 is a, is a huge number. We, we don't usually see numbers anything like this big in physics. <laughs> um, which, which, which really suggests that, that we're barking up the wrong tree here. So it seems more likely that dark matter just has the same kind of density as light matter, which allows us to go and estimate the number of vampires out there by taking the total mass of dark matter and dividing by the average mass of a, of a human, and, and we get about uh, 10 to the 52 <laughs> vampires. Seems like a reasonable estimate. <laughs> so given that there are so many vampires and there's so much dark matter out there, why are we failing to detect it? 
Well, we think that the experimental methodology that's currently used is, is flawed. Uh, so a common way that scientists go and look for dark matter is through trying to uh, catch it in direct detection traps, which vampires just don't go in. <laughs> while others are indirectly looking for dark matter by uh, watching for particles that scatter off it as it re-enters our atmosphere. But, but vampires rarely leave our atmosphere in the first place. <laughs> so we're proposing a new line of research uh, that, uh, that uses the VAMP model to inform its decisions. So we're going to look at uh, the most common vampiric interaction, which is a vampire turning into a bat. <laughs> so this starts off with your standard vamp anti vamp annihilation. <laughs> producing a, a dark photon, uh, which then does something called uh, kinetic mixing to turn itself into a photon. So, so kinetic mixing is this mechanism that allows a dark photon to become a light photon through a mechanism that is so trivially simple that I won't bore you with the details here. <laughs> and then the light photon itself goes and decays into a regular matter, particle-antiparticle pair. And through an as of yet un, un, not understood biological mechanism, all these end products are going to aggregate to finally produce a bat-antibat pair. <laughs> Um, and the excess mass from the vampire is expelled as a cloud of smoke to disguise the transformation. <laughs> and this lost mass actually goes and explains why vampires can turn into bats, but we never see bats turning into vampires. <laughs> and, and this broken vampire-to-bat symmetry suggests that we need to go and take the existing um, idea of uh, conservation of CPT, like a uh, charge, parity, and time. We need to take that paradigm and, and add, add bats as well. <laughs> so... Yeah, so, so charge, parity, time, and also bats conservation. Um, we, my research team and I, we, we understand that uh, a lot of this is going to possibly rankle some in the, the scientific establishment. There's a lot of entrenched views on dark matter. Um, but actually, we, we found there's a lot of scientific organizations out there who are very receptive to this sort of thing, which you can, you can prove for yourself uh, just by searching for uh, bat conservation. Uh. <laughs> Well, it is consistent with all observations of dark matter. <laughs> do you have a plan for uh, detecting uh, the, the vamp? I mean, how do you plan to take your research forwards? All right, okay. So um, the idea is we've made quite a testable prediction there, which is um, conservation of bats necessarily implies you get bat-anti-bat pair production. So if there really are vampires out there, we should expect to be seeing uh, very large numbers of anti-bats. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, that's testable right there. We, uh, we don't really yet have a, have a kind of concrete experimental plan. We're more of the theory side of... <laughs> yeah, um, so, so one thing you could do is you could go into uh, the biggest kind of um, bat colonies. Uh, some of them are like upwards of tens of millions of bats. It's, it's crazy. Um, and, and you could just try chucking matter at them and seeing if any of them explode. <laughs> But, but, like, you, you try getting the grant money for that. It's, it's... Um, have you considered the uh, possibility that it may be that scientists will need to be virgins to be able to detect... <laughs> Yeah, so we did actually go and look into um, what we thought might be some of the ideal lab conditions. Because you can probably modify the direct detection traps to actually encourage vampires to go into them, right? So, so we looked at things like modifying cafeteria schedules so there's no garlic bread on the menu. Um, oh, uh, making the scientists' lives more stressful so that they, um, you know, have higher blood pressure. Um, but, but yeah, like the, the virgin thing as well. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure it's, it's always a huge problem with uh, scientists. But... Uh, <laughs> Spe speaking, speaking from personal experience, yeah, it is, uh, <laughs> it's just... Uh... Um, I have a few questions, <laughs> just, just, just a few. Uh, I'm a little iffy on where are these, are they on Earth? Are they, are they in space? Oh, okay, so... Um, I mean, we're all in space, but you, 
so, so 10 to the 52 is, is a very big number, and you wouldn't be able to fit them all on Earth. Um, but it turns out space is, is really big. Um, so, so, I have heard that. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm no, oh, no, I am an expert, oh God. Um, <laughs> I'm an expert on dark matter and can confidently assert that dark matter is basically just smeared out everywhere. It's, it's everywhere, inside every um, mote of sunlight, uh, like ev inside every laughter of, of child. <laughs> Inside every nebula. So there are just vampires everywhere. Yeah, just everywhere. across all of space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's actually it's kind of you know really quite scary if you think about it. <laughs> it, re it really makes you appreciate how how small you are, right? It's... So I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I... <laughs> I'd just like to confirm that scientists are eternally grateful that you don't do this as a job. <laughs> I mean, there's no coming back from that. Uh... <laughs>